Welcome to another episode on bundle branch blocks. In the last lecture, we discussed the left bundle branch block and how it appears on ECG. Today, we will talk about right bundle branch block. By now, you're familiar with the electrical system of the heart, with the sinus node that gives rise to the P wave as the signal spreads across the atria. Then the signal enters the AV node, gets delayed for a split second, and then is passed down through the His bundle and the bundle branches, which results in depolarization of the ventricles that gives rise to the QRS complex. Well, recognizing conduction system disease is not difficult, but you have to understand what the QRS complex looks like. First of all, a very important concept is that the bundle branches are made up of specialized cells, long heart muscle cells that are designed for very rapid conduction velocity. These cells bring the signal down to the ventricles in a very rapid, efficient manner. The conduction velocity is literally meters per second. If everything is working properly, if the right side of the heart and the left side of the heart get the signal more or less at the same time, the whole entire heart winds up contracting in a very efficient manner. So what you get is a very narrow QRS complex. The normal QRS duration is usually 80 to maybe 110 milliseconds. Anything greater than 120 milliseconds is consistent with some kind of conduction system disease, and you usually start looking for a bundle branch block with that. The reason the QRS becomes wide is because when one of the bundles is diseased, the signal doesn't get down that bundle efficiently. Instead, what happens is the signal goes down the contralateral, or the opposite bundle, and then the myocardial depolarization finds excitable cells, and the cells pass the signal from one to another in order to depolarize the opposite side, which did not get the signal in time. The important concept to understand is that the bundle branch doesn't have to be blocked in order for the QRS to become widened. The key is that one of the bundles has to be a little slower than the other, and then you'll get this phenomenon where the QRS takes longer to originate because the signals are going down slower cell-to-cell -cell connections instead of the rapid Purkinje system. But it doesn't have to be blocked, so the word block is a little bit of a misnomer. I'm sure you've heard of incomplete bundle branch blocks. Well, what does incomplete mean? Well, you see the word block simply implies delay. So you can have a little bit of delay, or you can have a lot of delay. And that's going to affect how the QRS looks, and obviously, how wide the QRS is going to be. Okay, let's get a little bit more specific. If you're looking at the limb leads, 1, 2, and 3. Generally, if you have a normal QRS complex, a normal QRS is going to be up in 1, and it's going to be up in AVF, assuming that you have a normal axis. Lead 2 will generally be a little bit taller than lead 1, because axis usually runs in this direction, down into the left, and lead 3 will often be a bit smaller, because lead 3 is looking in this direction. So what happens when the right bundle doesn't conduct properly is that the electrical signal travels through the left ventricle normally. So the initial part of the QRS complex stays the same. But then the right ventricle depolarizes late. Now where is the right ventricle located? It's located on the right side of the body, but also anterior. So if I were to draw the chest here with the sternum in the front and the spine in the back, the right ventricle is more in the anterior part of the heart and the left ventricle is more posterior. Okay, so when the right bundle is blocked to any degree, you have the latter part of the QRS complex later signals after the left ventricle has completed its sequence of activation. Now you have the right ventricle depolarizing later, and where does it show up? Well, it shows up on the lateral leads because after all lateral leads, like lead 1, are looking. Remember, lead 1 is from right arm to left arm, so it's looking for signals that are going towards the left side. Since the right ventricle is on the right side and signals are traveling away, what's going to happen is that you're going to wind up seeing late signals in the lateral leads. So what you'll see is a negative signal on the tail end of the QRS complex. Why is it so small? Because the right ventricle is relatively thin and it doesn't generate a lot of electrical current. And why is it wide? Because these signals are traveling slowly from cell to cell, it takes longer to get around the right ventricle. And why is it negative? It's negative because these signals are going in the opposite direction 
than where lead 1 is looking at, so it's inscribed as a negative signal. So you can imagine that AVL is going to look much like lead 1. In fact, they usually look the same because they're both looking at the lateral wall of the heart. So AVL is going to look this way, 30 degrees above the horizontal. Now how will that look in the inferior leads? Well, it really kind of depends on the axis, but it's not uncommon for people to see delayed signals in the inferior leads, because after all, the QRS duration now has widened. You're looking at 120 milliseconds or greater for a right bundle branch block, and so in lead 3, there's going to be a late signal here. It's not exactly consistent, because the signal is going in the opposite direction. Now, what about the precordial leads? What about V1 through V6? Well, remember, V5 and V6 are also lateral leads, and they're going to look just like 1 and AVL, with a fairly normal P wave. The beginning part of the QRS should look normal because that represents left ventricular activation, but there is going to be a wide S wave, as classic pattern, for a right bundle branch block. Now, what's V1 and V2 going to look like? Well, these are actually the easiest ones to recognize. Because the right ventricle is anterior, it's actually very close to V1 and V2, and so the signals from the right ventricle tend to be relatively large. Now, normally, what should V1 look like? Normally, V1 should have a small septal R wave, and then a deep S wave followed by an upright T. Just as a review, that septal R wave occurs because the septum is generally depolarized off the left bundle and so septal depolarization travels anteriorly and to the patient's right. So you get a positive deflection initially in V1, that little tiny R wave, and that's also what explains these little tiny Q waves in the lateral leads, such as I've drawn here in V5 and V6. This little tiny Q wave is a negative deflection as the septum depolarizes, and this signal goes away from V5 and V6. You get this negative signal, that's a Q wave. So you get this septal R wave in V1, and then you have a normal QRS complex in general. But now, what happens in a right bundle branch block is that you get these late signals travelling towards V1 and V2, because the right ventricle is depolarizing late. So what you get is this positive deflection, which corresponds with the S wave in 1 and AVL, V5 and V6, but in V1, it's a positive deflection, if I redraw it's known as an R prime. It corresponds with the S wave here, but because the signal is going towards V1 and V2, it's a positive deflection. It's also very common for the T wave to become inverted, because when the sequence of depolarization is thrown off, the sequence of repolarization is usually thrown off. So instead of having an upright T wave with the right bundle branch block, there's usually a negative T wave. Now this RSR prime pattern, the relationship between the left and the right ventricular masses, and the timing between the two ventricles can look like this, or it can sometimes have a more prominent R prime pattern. In fact, on occasion, you'll see notching like this when the R wave is taller than the S wave. Okay, well let's get to some tracings. So here's a normal sinus rhythm at a rate of about 70 beats per minute with a normal PR interval. When you look at the QRS complex, it looks almost normal. I think if you measure it, it winds up being about 110 milliseconds. It's upright in 1 and AVF, so the axis is normal. But when you glance at the precordial leads, this is where you'll see this R prime. You have an RSR prime pattern. You can see the R prime also in V2. However, the QRS duration is not long enough to call this a right bundle branch block, because the right ventricle is not depolarizing that much later than the left side. So what you have is just simply delay in the right bundle branch. Some people will call this a right ventricular conduction delay, but most cardiologists will go ahead and label this an incomplete right bundle branch block. Again, incomplete block is a bit of a misnomer. But, in any case, this is a typical example of a right IVCD. Now, if you notice, there is a little bit of an S wave that's prominent, especially here, but it's not terribly wide. The next example is a classic right bundle branch block pattern. Here, you have a little bit faster heart rates, about 105 or 110 beats per minute. When you look at the limb leads, you see there's a very nice broad S wave here, in 1 and AVL. Even the voltage is a little bit low, and you have a beautiful RSR prime in V1 and V2 
and even V3. The R wave is very small, and it grows, and so the R wave progression is normal. The total QRS duration here is about 130, maybe 140 milliseconds, so we would call this a right bundle branch block. It's classic. You should never miss this. So that's it for today. See you in the next lesson.